Hello and welcome to the Leaders in AppSec. I'm your host, Matthias Madou, CTO and co-founder of Secure Code Warrior. With me today, I have three fantastic panelists. I have Rina Shah, Lee Thurlow, and um, Murat uh, Yesayan. Rina, do you mind introducing yourself? Yep. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here. So my name is Rina Shah, and I'm Director of Strategy, Culture, and Services at the London Stock Exchange Group. Um, super interested in this area. I have been for a, for a number of years, specifically developers and, you know, how we can incorporate uh, good security in their coding. So excited to take part in this. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Lee, any words from you? Yes, I'm Lee Thurlow. I'm the application security lead in Marks and Spencers. Really enjoying the digital transformation in MS and driving the DevSecOps roadmap and uh, trying to speed up the way we do security for the engineers. Fantastic. Welcome to the panel. Murat? Thanks, Matthias. Thanks for having me. I'm Murad Yasayan. I'm a managing director at Paladin Capital Group. Uh, we're one of the world's most active venture capital firms uh, focused on cybersecurity. We invest globally in early stage innovative companies um, tackling um, the most problematic cybersecurity uh, challenges uh, with a big focus on the uh, human element as well, which I think is very, uh, a re very relevant uh, part. So looking forward to the discussion. Couldn't agree more. Thank you very much, Murat. So for today, I was wondering do we have numbers? And luckily, we have numbers. And as Jim Barksdale, the former CEO of Netscape, once said, if we have data, let's look at the data. If we all have our opinions, let's go with mine. So luckily for today, we have data. We have data from Evans Data. And quite frankly, I, I have to admit, you know, I don't think it's wrong to, to form our own opinions based on the data. So to kick it off, let's, um, let's look at a piece of data. 46% of development managers say that they themselves or their development leaders um, should be the people who are ultimately responsible for application security. So less than half of the development managers say that they should be responsible. Murat, what do you think? Should secure coding really be, you know, only of the, of the development managers or should it be everybody's responsibility? Yeah, thanks, Matthias. Well, I think, um, <clears throat> I, th I think most organizations are starting to realize that it's uh, an overall organizational responsibility. And, um, you know, what we're finding is that, um, you know, people can actually be a first and kind of best line de of defense if we give them security awareness training, if we can build skills, if we can give them the tools that they need. Um, and I think we've seen that go through in other areas in cybersecurity where, for example, um, you know, one of the most susceptible threat vectors was um, users clicking on, on phishing emails. And while that's still a challenge, you've had a whole industry called security awareness training for email users so that if you can't tell the difference between a good email versus a bad email, then you, you can't hold that person accountable for being a security expert. And so I think there's these large populations of users, whether they're technical or non-technical in organizations or whether they're developers, I think we have to realize that not everybody is a security expert and security teams are relatively small and strained. And so the more broadly we can um, develop those skills and understandings across the organization, the easier it gets, I think, for everyone. Um, and so what I think we're going to see is that, as specifically to your question, though, is I think we're going to see overall responsibility for um, uh, products or product lines, and uh, and that'll have responsibility for all aspects of the product, ranging from the development, the user experience, uh, drawing upon um, AppSec as needed for security. But um, I think rather than seeing AppSec just as a service for um, for the entire organization, which can then result in kind of bottlenecks and friction, um, I think you're going to start to see it become integrated as part of um, you know responsibility for uh, overall product management and making sure that the product is secure is just part of making sure that the product um, is um, you know satisfactory. So interesting. So. Let's see if Lee agrees with that because Lee, um, your application security lead. So essentially, your peers tell you that you it's your responsibility. What do you think? I think actually responsibility is shifting towards engineers now for security, as we're seeing the uh, you know the increased pace in which we're able to push code into production. Um, you know, some teams are now looking at 
between committing a change and putting it into production is 10 minutes. And traditional security just cannot keep up with that. You can't wait for a, a large scan to to finish and then you know, you know, two hours later you come back with some vulnerabilities and that doesn't work. So we're seeing that real shift into teams managing their and being responsible for security of their products. And that's DevOps in a, in a nutshell. But I think also then it becomes the difference between responsibility and accountability. Security teams still have to have accountability. They still have to have technical enforcement points. And then just how we do those technical enforcements change. So you're now looking at your pipelines, you're automating a lot of the security into that. There's a security overlay. So you have guardrails that allow teams to do whatever it is that they want to do but they can't step outside of predefined boundaries. And if they do want to go out of there, there has to be a, uh, an exceptions process. So the automation and the speed in which things are happening is changing where security responsibilities lie, but I don't think accountability changes so much. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think we need everybody um, to rally around the same thing and we need everybody on this journey to write secure code and, and produce reliable software. So second, oh, please go ahead. Oh, good, Lee. Um, second piece of data, 56%. So a little bit over half of the developers and managers believe that secure coding is associated with using scanning tools on deployed applications. And a similar amount, a little bit over half, again, of the developers and the managers believe that secure coding is associated with manually reviewing code for vulnerabilities. So Rina, somewhere in your title is strategy as well as process. Um, how can we move from, from a reactive to more of a preventative approach? Um, I think this one comes really down to um, the, the culture within the organization. So, um, you know, there, there, there's a lot of uh, organizations that do have your secure code scanning in place. I think uh, most of those organizations will, but it's very much about how um, the, the developers and, and the people working on this view security and that end-to-end -end process. So, you know, while scanning tools have a really great place, um, it, it is that end-to-end -end process. And it's really the training and um, the, the, the culture within the, the development teams um, that can kind of do that shift from reacting to, oh, there's a bug and we need to try and very quickly sort it out to actually right from the beginning ingraining that security right throughout the process. Okay. Murat, I was actually wondering, can we scan our way out of this problem? Um, can, can tools get out of this insecure coding problem? Right. <clears throat> no, I, I agree with Rena. I mean, I think the testing tools, the scanning tools, it, it's necessary, but not sufficient, right? They're, they're not going to go away. They're part of good practice because you have to have um, all kinds of different controls and, and processes across the development life cycle. Um, but I think one of the things that it comes down to fundamentally is that we can't view cybersecurity as, you know, technology versus technology. It's, it's about people um, because the adversary is, um, you know, a motivated human with technology at their disposal that's going to exploit vulnerabilities, um, you know, for various reasons, you know, financial gain and, and other things that they're, that they're after. So, um, so we also have to have a strategy for the people inside of organizations that are developing and maintaining um, apps, but of course, we'll continue to use the tools, but then hopefully if we can instill better practices before we um, deploy those scanning tools and after the fact testing, hopefully we get um, a lot less bad news coming out of those, uh, which then uh, frees up everybody's time uh, you know, to do more productive things. So it's about optimizing your, your budget, right? You want to spend money on, on, on each of these buckets so that they all work to the best of, of their capabilities, finding the problems that they're best at finding. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Um, a, th a third number to throw into this group, 97% um, of the developers surveyed say that they have adequate and sufficient training. So they said, hey, you know what? We have it. And 95% of them um, said that the training was valuable. However, you know, um, there's still a constant rise of problems that we see. It, it is not going down. So Lee, I was actually wondering with, with these numbers, if you look at, hey, we, we get enough training and it is valuable, but still we see SQL injection. How is it actually introduced SQL injection and, and what can we do about it? 
I think there's an awful lot of reliance on the technology and the frameworks as well. So if we look at things like you know, React coming in and various other little frameworks, that, I mean, there's a reliance on ORM to take care of your SQL statements. There's a belief that the frameworks and technologies that they're using can get them out of trouble, which means that there is also a lack of understanding when they are in trouble. I think that's part of the problem that I'm seeing right now. Um, and I'm not entirely convinced that we are doing the training in the right way. I'm not entirely convinced that we are delivering that quality of training and expertise into our engineers. We think we might be, but um, I, I'm not convinced we are. There's a huge change in the way that we're delivering products now, you know, containerization, serverless, the speed in which we're able to do that, the different enforcement points in there. We're introducing SQL injection simply by pulling in dependencies into our containers. Um, the shift away from servers into containers is also confusing, um, not only engineers, in some cases I'm finding, but also product managers. We're not allocating the right time, the right training, the right upskilling of our engineers to tackle those problems at the right places. So I'm not entirely convinced that we're delivering the correct training at the correct points. I, I love the point that you're making. I actually like frameworks. If it's embedded by default, perfect. But there's so much legacy stuff that it is really, really hard because we're building stuff on stuff on the broken stuff that is really hard to get out of it. So training, yes, absolutely necessary. If you can do the frameworks, I think it's a combination of the two, reliable frameworks and a good set of training. Yeah. Reliable frameworks, but also understanding if we're going to move to another framework, so from one framework to another one, do we have the tools and capabilities and the processes to be able to support it? So, um, you know, scanning tools, we've mentioned it, they can't always support some of the new technologies that we're going to, or they can support it, but again, they're not designed to, so they're not fast enough. So we can give them all the awareness then, you can train somebody up so that they're fully aware of how to avoid these things, but you're not providing the detection capabilities. So. They know how to fix it, but they can't find it. And then the other side of it is, which is where you see poor training practices or poor awareness, we find it, but they don't know how to fix it. And then you get immune to seeing red. Um, mm -hmm. I think that I'm, I see quite a lot of where seeing bad becomes the normal. So because nothing ever happens, it's okay. Yeah, and, and, and that's where, that's where people really you know, get frustrated. The developers, for example, when they see a lot of red, when you point out problems, um, that, that's very frustrating. So, so Rina, your title also contains a piece of, of culture. Um, so security, let's be honest, it's, it's quite often not well received. Um, how, how do you keep the company and more specifically developers engaged with writing secure code? Yeah, um, I agree with everything that Lee's just spoken about. And I think, you know, when it comes to it really depends on the approach that's being taken. So we often do see um, a kind of a, a poor approach um, and it is changing, but, you know, sort of poor approach to training where um, traditionally you may just chuck out some sort of e-learning out to your developers, ask them to take a test at the end. And that's about it. Um, actually, what you need to do is really engage, um, you know, the people that you want to train and get them to actually want to do it themselves and, and you know, want to really understand what the concepts are in that training. And that's very different just to pushing out some sort of e-learning. So there's many, many different ways that you can start engaging. I mean, personally, and I know I'm a bit biased here, but I think security is quite an exciting topic and to a lot of people in technology um you know you can kind of use that element of you know what's happening in security around the world is it's a big topic try and use that to really entice people to take part in your different initiatives whether that be you know sort of securathons hackathons um to really get people engaged and um really wanting themselves to learn about security um, and good practices so that they can apply it then to their work so i think there there's we're seeing it happen. We're seeing a shift to your traditional approach to training to, um, you know, kind of these new, more engaging ways to, to, to get people interested in what you're doing. But then ultimately, you know, you can you can provide all of this. It's all about that actual behavior change. And you need people to understand and change their behaviors based on what they're learning. So I think that's what the focus really needs to be on professionals that are trying to really teach people or engage people um, in, in this area. I, I like it. What, so you're also referring to 
as close as possible to real world, real world examples, real world code, um, real world breaches, real world examples of how companies get get breached. Um, are you actively using that within the organization? You're trying to get as close as possible to real? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that's what gets people's attention. If they can actually see that what we're talking about, it is a real threat and actually we see it happening out there and these are the consequences. Um, it just gets people that, that sort of thinking that actually, yes, this could happen and and let's try, you know, it depends again on your culture, but if you've got the right culture um, within the organization, then people want to, you know, do a really good job and, you know, what they're doing, they want to protect their company. So um, absolutely, real world examples are, are, are really important. Murat, um, you're investing a lot in, in these these uh, cybersecurity companies. Um, we're, we're, tr we're talking about the human aspect. How important is that human aspect over here? Yeah, I think it's <clears throat> critical and it's across a number of different areas. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, it's, it's, not, it's around software developers like we're talking about now. It's about the IT professionals and individuals in the security operations center. I think it's a continuous process to um, enable these individuals to have the skills that they need and trying to balance the uh, imbalance that exists right now between um, the advantage that adversaries have and, and how hard it is to, um, you know, to be a defender. So there's, there's a lot of different areas where we need to constantly build uh, skill and make sure that, um, um, that we're meeting the, the challenge that's being uh, done by the innovation that the, that the adversary continues to have. Um, and I think picking up on the earlier point, I think it's really encouraging that such a high ratio of developers like the training and find it useful. And I think maybe as organizations start to have more data, I, I think the other piece of it that's going to be very helpful is if you give people context for then what the um, additional positive effects of that are so that it's not just a conversation of security for the sake of security. And, and of course, we know that, you know, bad things can happen because, you know, uh, if there's vulnerabilities in code, but but also tie it to the fact that, you know, secure coding is actually uh, more efficient coding, right? Because in the in the long run, if you're spending less time doing rework and remediation, then that's um, more time that you're spending doing what you actually want to do as a developer, which is, you know, build really cool applications um, and get them pushed out to customers. And that's, that's better for um, the developer organization, that's better for uh, the business that's more efficient, that's more productive. Um, and so helping tie those um, things into what the overall additional you know, benefits are and the business value is really important. But it takes time to see that. It's not going to happen one day after you implement um, a program and, and adopt certain uh, tools and, and, and processes. But um, that's something to keep, I think, everybody focused on uh, because those, those positive effects will certainly come. Perfect segue into the next number, Murat. Um, because while um, you're, you're advocating for, hey, let's do it the secure way, let's let's try and build secure code, and it doesn't take more time. In our in in that survey, 91 percent of uh, development managers says that actually implementing secure code practices is tough, and more than eighty eight percent of the developers says that secure coding is is just a challenge for them. Um, so, Lee, as as an application security lead, um, first of all, do you agree that that it is tough that as a development manager, you say, hey, you know what, implementing that, making sure that developers code securely, it is a tough job? I do agree. It's very tough. Um, and I think it boils down to a number of uh, scenarios as to why. Um, where do you start? So you have to have a very mature program to get going to make that smooth. Uh, and it's time. Um, you know, Developers are trying to move features through now at an even more phenomenal pace than they were before. And secure coding and doing it properly, well, you have to learn that, you have to build up that skill, and every five minutes we come up with another way of showing them how they got it wrong. Uh, I think it is very tough, and it takes a long time to build up the security champions within your organization. It takes a long time to build up the, the awareness of what to do when you see something and what to avoid rather than putting it in the first place. I do think it's very, very tough. I've seen it takes years, really, to build up that culture and build up that way of working so that people find it easier. What's, what's the first thing that you did to, to make it going? Or maybe the thing that you had most success with? 
Most success is making friends, actually. Um, as an AppSec guy, I'm usually the enemy. Um, I'm usually coming in and kicking people's door down and saying that your baby is ugly sort of thing. It's, it's very bad and very hard to say to people, um, your code is wrong. Um, and I think it's something that Peter has spoken about on more than one occasion. We often, especially in AppSec, are telling people where they got it wrong. But, you know, that's great. Getting it wrong, fantastic. How do you fix it? And then we usually come up with statements that are very simple, input sanitization, that sort of stuff. Well, what does all of that mean? So we're not actually providing enough framework and knowledge in there. So making friends with the engineering teams and understanding where they are, the challenges that they have, what works for them. So each engineering team has a process that they like to see so that you can then start to build in some institutional knowledge. So they're, they're not front-end facing, so they don't need to worry about certain category, you know, categories of vulnerabilities. Let's, let's train them on these areas. Uh, and that's work because then you can create security champions who then start to spread the love to other engineers. And then you start to create a community. Because AppSec, we're so outnumbered. We, there is one of us to every 200 of them. It's the only way that we can move it forward. So essentially what you're saying is you're also working on that aspect of the 88% of developers that find it tough. You're as a manager, as a lead, you're trying to help over there. Yeah, I'm trying to remove the obstacles uh, to, you know, to production. The part of production needs to be as clean as possible. It needs to be as fast as possible and automated as possible. If every time we come in as a blocker and saying, no, that's wrong, no, that's wrong, Eventually, we just become the rock in the river that they want to go around because all we keep on doing is stopping them from getting on with their job. So it's making friends, building up that relationship, you know, the culture, really, of we're, we're here to help. Uh, and if it keeps on happening, then surely something that we can do to avoid it. And that then is how we build up that institutional knowledge, that expertise within the engineers to avoid the issues that they keep on repeating. All right. Last number I want to throw into the group. 81% of the developer managers are more likely to hire developers who have secure coding skills. And some also ask these questions in interviews. Murat, um, do you foresee secure coding skills to being a future hiring must? I, I think it's certainly going to be a differentiator for, for a candidate. So I think um, candidates will probably find that, you know, if that's an important um, facet to organizations, which I think it increasingly is, they're probably going to be more sought after. Uh, maybe they can, uh, uh, you know, earn more and, and uh, uh, an organization realize that a developer who codes more securely is also more productive. Um, so I think the candidates are going to start to see the benefit of that in the long run. I think in the short run, I think it's probably difficult for that to be an explicit hiring filter because it's still hard to find talent. Um, but also I think we've seen that, uh, and as we've been talking about is you can use technology platforms and you can have programs that actually um, build those skills. So if we believe that we can um, upskill them, um, you know, we don't necessarily want to make it an exclusionary um, uh, filter, but I think that developers themselves will start to see the value as they progress in their careers um, that having, uh, you know, having those skills is, is giving them perhaps more opportunities. Um, down the line. I, I, I agree. And I think developers should see that same thing as well. They should also realize that, you know, it's only if, you, if you're a very senior developer, if you have all the basics down, um, if you finally realize that people are misusing your code, that you start to say, oh my God, you know, um, people are doing this with my code. They are actually misusing my code. It's only at that point in time um, that you become a security savvy developer, that you're essentially a good developer, um, and that you say, you know what, now I can use my skill and I will be highly sought after. Um, Rina, in your in your title, you have the cybersecurity strategy in your title, and I was actually wondering the same thing for you from a hiring perspective. Um, how does that fit in, in your cybersecurity strategy? Do you go after developers with security skills or do you take really good developers and do you upskill them? Yeah, I think it's really interesting and we're seeing a lot of shifts. So if you think about security as a whole and, and you think even about the CISO's position, you know, um, previously, a lot of the time you wanted someone that was super technical and, you know, kind of um, w was able to really, really get their hands dirty. And now actually what you're starting to see 
with um, kind of your, your, your new CISOs is you actually need someone that can really, really talk to the business, that can um, talk at the C-level about security. So it's a different skill. Yes, they need to have the technical skills, but they also need to have those really sort of good communication skills where they can express themselves. And I think we're starting to see this across security overall, a, a shift in actually a lot of the skills that are required. And the same can be said for developers. You know, previously, it may just be they needed to be able to develop good code. I think security now is a really, really important part. And, um, you know, it, it's something that's going to very much set you apart if you're able to, um, you, you've got that within your skill set to, to develop code securely and you understand security concepts. So I think overall, with the way um, technology is is going we're starting to see the shift in a number of different areas and um, that being said your risks your threat landscape is always changing so you know whilst you may hire someone in that that's got really good um, development knowledge and, and they've got the security skills because everything's changing all the time you're always going to continually have to provide that training and continue to upskill based on what the threat landscape is and, and what the new risks are so um yes it, it, you know try and get people in that already have a good base knowledge but you know you're going to have to continue that training on an ongoing basis finding finding these gems is super hard they need to be technically skilled they need to be social they need to have presentation skills it's very hard let's let's agree on that fact um, based on the findings that we've discussed today, any final tips on how to get this going into your organization? Um, how can you actually go from, from a reactive approach to more of a, pro, um, a preventative, proactive approach? Lee, any final tips from your side? I think from a, a, an AppSec person's perspective, you know, the, the change where we'd have a conversation, we talk about remediation, we talk about what we think you can go live with, what you can't go live with. Looking at how we facilitate that now um, with the assumption that there's a certain amount of awareness within your development team. Everything that we put in place has to be technically enforceable now. We have to be able to put in technically enforceable controls that reference our standards rather than invoking conversations that say, let's go live with this, or you shouldn't go live with that, or you know, this is a critical, but everything needs to be technically enforceable. From the moment you start coding, your infrastructure is code, your container space, all of that is now configurable and coded and should be and is possible to technically enforce all the way through there. That helps an awful lot getting the program off the ground because you're not then giving people a moving target. The goalposts are defined. They can be shifted through exceptions processes or business criticality. But that's certainly the way I'm seeing my world going. Everything is there. Developer presses the button, they can see exactly what will not pass our tests, what can't go in. And they can do that as many times as they like in, in the course of a day or an hour. And that's very important because then you find out whether or not you have the, the skills that you need within your team because they won't know how to solve the problem. Right Now let's help them through the journey. That's where I'm seeing our world going very quickly. So technical enforcement and then at the same time, make friends with the developers. And Absolutely. If, if you're not friends with them, then they're not going to listen to you. They're not going to want to use your processes. They're not. Get, they're only ever going to push back. And sometimes the pushback is useful because that tells you that actually maybe you haven't changed something that you need to change now. But other times the pushback, then you end up in a you know, just a brawl and nobody gets anywhere with that. You're then fighting the teams that need to deliver the business functionality. Thanks, Lee. Rina, any final tips? Um, I think my biggest tip is very much from the people perspective, and it's what Lee's already mentioned. Um, you know, within uh, the, the developer community, you're always going to get those people that have that extra interest in security. So there's kind of little gems that you can find around to start building up your um, developer champions. And, you know, I've done this in a, in a past organization where we wanted to roll out some um, really sort of engaging training, et cetera, in this space. And, you know, it was finding those people um, that are quite vocal, um, want to be involved. And actually, you know, other developers, they're going to listen to their developer peers compared to listening to us. So it's finding those people to really champion your activities. And I would say really, you know, they become a force multiplier of any sort of training and awareness team when you can find those people to really sort of champion what you're doing. So that would be my really big tip. 
find find those gems within within the developer communities. Great. It definitely all starts with the people. Murat, any final tips from your side? Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I think um, the more we can add um, tools around it, as Lee was saying, to help um, you know automate the the confidence that developers are going to have that um, that what they've done is um, is up to standard and, and adequate is really important. Um, but I think overall, I would also just add um, you know just make sure that organizations are building a program around it. And I think um, as Rena said, it's very much around the developer side in terms of making sure that it's it's engaging and that um, it starts to spread as something that is viewed very favorably. But then also from a business perspective, um, you know, use uh, methodologies like assessing um, and measuring the progress of um, of the developers and you know are they actually getting better? Are those skills building? Um, you know, be patient, but that is going to show progress over time. And make sure that both the development side, the AppSec side, and the entire organization understands the benefits that were achieved vis-a-vis um, -vis whether it's you know a differentiation of of the of the product in the market or you know other business benefits and business ROI that everybody helped achieve um, for the organization because um, secure coding was taken uh, uh, seriously. And I think then that is something that everybody can be. Um, really proud of, and then that just kind of continues to feed on itself. That this is now how we do business, rather than you know this is something that's a um, you know a cost center or a um, something that we have to um, uh, to tackle. So ultimately, if you can't measure it, don't do it. But also with the measurement, let's make sure that we measure the right thing, which supports our end goal, which is shipping reliable code. Yep, absolutely. All right, thank you very, very much, Lee, Rina, and Murat for this chat. Um, thank you very much for tuning in into the Leaders of AppSec. Thanks for having us. Thank you.